This is going to be a study on the different classes of baby Christians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1 says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So the Bible talks about Christians who are babies. They haven't matured in their Christian walk. And I believe all Christians act like babies at times. I don't consider myself to be a great spiritual mature Christian myself. But I have noticed many different types of babes in Christ. And let's look at these different classes of baby Christians. I've had this thought for a while but couldn't seem to put it in words. Some of the titles of each group of these baby Christians may not be the greatest, but I'm going to try my best. Number one, you have the baby genius. And I have witnessed this group of baby Christians on many occasions. They know all the strong meat of the Bible. But these babies probably even know more than a lot of mature Christians even. Yet these babies can't even practice the practical things in the Bible. They know all about Daniel's 70th week. They have the New Testament memorized and they know the timeline of the book of Revelation. Yet they can't sit in a room with another Christian who disagrees with them about something. They have absolutely no idea how to treat another Christian or another person. If they find out you disagree with them on any doctrine, then... Their eyes will glaze over, they pout, and maybe even call you a name. And this is the mark of a baby. For example, my daughter probably knows more Bible characters than most Christians who's been saved for 30 years. She can sit and point at the character and tell you who it is in the little Bible storybook. But she still acts like a baby. And that's how many Christians act. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 2 says, Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. These baby geniuses have so much knowledge, it has made them puffed up. They think they are better and more spiritual than all the other Christians. And the main reason you shouldn't get puffed up in your knowledge is because there is still so much you don't know. Ephesians 3.8 talks about the unsearchable riches of Christ. And you can search the scriptures daily, nightly, weekly, monthly, yearly, until you die and still not figure everything out. Romans 11.33 Oh, the depth of... Of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. You don't know anything when it comes right down to it. You may know more than the next ten Christians. This is only because God was graceful and gave you Bible knowledge that you didn't deserve. And you also probably had more free time to study than other people. Knowing more Bible doesn't necessarily make you a better or more mature Christian. It can actually lead you to being a brat if you listen to the devil while he tells you that you have so much more knowledge than other people. I have seen several seasoned Christians who know more Bible than I'll ever know. They'll sit down and mock and bash and criticize a new convert because they disagreed with them or questioned them. And this is nothing but a bully who wants to be the final authority while he claims the book is the final authority, which he really doesn't believe deep down, most likely. If you're so smart, then explain Revelation 10.4, which says that when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. You can't tell me what John wasn't allowed to write. And if you can't tell me that, then you don't know the entire Bible. So nobody knows the entire Bible. A lot of these people, many times, they don't use their Bible knowledge for good. 
but rather to make others feel inferior. I know of some Christians that have so much Bible knowledge they are starting a cult and they're the only members in it. They can't find anyone else who meets their standard. Stop and think and realize not everyone is like you or on the same spiritual level as you. Some need improvement in some places that others don't need. You may be better in some places than others, and they're probably better in some places than you. Some have talents that you don't have. The cure for this type of baby Christian could be to go through the Pauline epistles, write down all the practical things, and practice them in his everyday life. He should lay off the meat until he can get the milk. 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If you're going to grow, then you're going to have to read the entire Bible. Go through the Pauline epistles. Do what Paul says. You can get stuff from the Old Testament, from the Gospels. All the stuff is for our learning. But moving on, the next baby we're going to look at is the impressionable, over-trusting baby. Kids are very impressionable, and they go back and forth. Uh, some babies will go up to any stranger. Some babies will let anyone hold them. Some kids will get in a van with anyone who offers them candy. They're easily deceived, and they, they go back and forth with things. One day they like this. One day they like that. They hear somebody say something's good. So they'll go with that, or they'll hear somebody say, this is good, so they'll do that. They're back and forth with things. That's the way kids are. The same thing goes for many Christians. They will fall for any false teacher if he tells them what they want to hear. And many young kids have got in a car with a stranger because they promised the kid something, and it led to this kid being kidnapped. He was deceived. Kids are easily deceived. 2 Peter 2.19 says, While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. See that phrase, they promised them liberty. A lot of false teachers promise things, but they're not really truthful in what they're saying. Ephesians 4.14 says that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive notice that it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro you have some christians that are tossed to and fro they're like a child they're baby christians one week you see they're a calvinist the next week, they are a hyper-dispensationalist, hyper while before they were a moderate dispensationalist just a week ago. The next week, they say people were saved by looking forward to the cross in the Old Testament after they were just claiming to be a moderate dispensationalist. Then one week, they are King James only. The next week, they use the modern Bibles. They are back and forth and easily deceived. They get a hold of something that sounds good or a doctrine that has become a trend and they will then get on the bandwagon just because it sounds good. Now, there's another side of this. If you find out something's true from the Bible and you've been teaching something wrong, then change it. What I'm referring to is people who this week they're a Calvinist. Next week they're not. The next week they're... Uh, Seventh-day Adventists, the next week they're this, the next week they're replacement theology. It's like they hear something, they think it sounds good, and instead of really getting it from the Bible, they're just going along with a trend. And that's like a children. It's like a babe in Christ. Second Timothy 4, three says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. The devil is subtle, and he knows how to deceive. 2 Corinthians 11.3 says, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, 
so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Through your life as a Bible student, some of your doctrines and ideas are going to change if you read the Bible. It would be weird if you still believe everything that you believed when you first got saved. You learn some things and you grow. But going from a King James Bible believer one week to a user of the modern Bibles the next week is just a strange thing. Going from believing in the free will of man to being a Calvinist overnight is a strange thing. Befriending a bunch of like-minded Bible believers one week and then dumping them for the modern Christians the next week shows you are just following a trend. There are some things that you can be settled on and hold on to. But the next type of baby is the tinfoil hat babies. And if you don't what I know what I mean by tinfoil hat, someone who wears a tinfoil hat does so because they think it protects them from government surveillance, mind control, or mind reading extraterrestrials. Basically, I'm saying they are paranoid. I myself am a big believer in conspiracy theories, and the Bible talks about conspiracies. Acts 4.26 says the kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. And if that's not true today, then the world's gotten a little bit better. But the world gets worse. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The people that are over everything are against the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a conspiracy, and it's true. I do believe there is a conspiracy going on in the government. The rulers of this world are still against Christ. I do believe the government is ran by the devil, and rulers are influenced by spiritual wickedness in high places. I believe in the, the Illuminati. And I do believe basically every secular musician has sold out to Satan for fame and fortune. I also believe things aren't always what they seem. And most of the content on the news is just a bunch of lies. I also do believe wicked men in leadership may cause staged catastrophes so that they can create more laws and take away freedoms. By doing this, they gain more control over the people. And it makes them easier to gain more and more control. With this being said, you have all kinds of baby Christians, these tinfoil hat babies, who spend all their time on the internet watching conspiracy theory videos, which isn't wrong, but they're not practicing moderation. They're spending all their time on those videos. They may read their Bible, but they know more about a false flag and about 9-11 being an inside job than they do the Bible. They can tell you all about the conspiracy theories, but yet these babies couldn't tell you who King Manasseh is, or Queen Vashti, or Er, or Onan, or Gomer, or any of those Old Testament characters. They don't really know the doctrines of salvation, most likely. They couldn't explain redemption, justification, imputation, propitiation. And these conspiracy theories, I believe they're needful to know and you should look into those things. And they're needful at times. But they can excite the flesh more than Bible reading and they can get you out of the Bible. And this causes people to neglect their Bible reading and spend all of their time on the computer looking up videos about Illuminati blood sacrifices. They pretty much believe that every celebrity who dies is an Illuminati blood sacrifice. And they spend all their time educating themselves through Alex Jones and other money-hungry YouTube channels until they can't even sleep in the dark anymore because they're so afraid. They think a Jesuit is hiding under their bed. Uh, they can't listen to preaching because they believe the preacher is an undercover Freemason because he wears purple socks. Uh, they think a preacher is supporting Halloween if he has a pumpkin in his church in the fall time of the year. If a preacher doesn't talk about the New World Order or CERN or transhumanism, Pizzagate, spirit cooking, 
false flags, inside jobs, all seeing eyes, the flat earth, or Bigfoot, then they just won't watch that preacher because that's not exciting their flesh. They can't sit through a sermon that focuses on Jesus Christ. If the title is talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, they just won't watch it. It just doesn't excite their flesh. So while they listen to the preacher, if they do listen to it, they will just look for hidden symbols in this church or hunt for a false doctrine so they can attack him or call him a Freemason or something. They will then call him a secret Mormon, a Jehovah's Witness, a Freemason, a Jesuit. Even though his church is called such and such Baptist church and he is preaching against sin using King James Bible. This is because they are tinfoil hat babies and they are paranoid. They've watched so many conspiracy theory videos, they think everyone is out to get them. They put some magic glasses on and it could somehow tells them who's an alien and who is a Mason, who's a Mormon, and who's not on the right side. They somehow have super spiritual eyes so they can see that. And it is good to expose the unfruitful works of darkness and to reprove them and not be ignorant of Satan and his devices. But the Bible also mentions temperance. If you spend all your time on those things, then you're going to become a paranoid nutcase. You aren't going to have confidence in anyone and you're going to move out in a cabin in the middle of the woods away from everybody. You're not going to trust anybody. You're going to lose faith in the Bible because you think CERN changed it through the Mandela effect. And a lot of these tinfoil hat types of baby Christians just want to eat candy and be entertained. They don't want the milk and the meat of the word. And once these babies become experts in the conspiracy theory field, they will resemble the baby genius because they get puffed up from all their knowledge. They will bash everyone who isn't aware of these conspiracy theories, even to the point of calling them cover-ups for the Illuminati, for all these false flags, which there are false flags. I'm not denying that weird things aren't happening. But there is always a balance. A good example of someone with a great balance is David Hoffman. He's a good preacher. He talks quite a bit about conspiracy theories. And he preaches the Bible verse by verse. He definitely doesn't just touch on conspiracy theories. Make people aware of what's going on in the wicked world, but don't major in the minors. That's a good principle I learned from him. Don't major in the little things, major in the big things. Talk about the little things from time to time, but don't make your whole life about those things. And number four, this baby is pretty similar to the previous. We have the sci-fi babies. And these babies resemble the tinfoil hat babies in that they only want to major on one subject the stranger things in the Bible. There are a lot of things in the Bible that seem like something from a sci-fi movie. And this is because Satan gets movie ideas from the scriptures. And there is no new thing under the sun, and Satan is an imitator of Christ. He counterfeits everything he does. And there are a lot of strange doctrines in the Bible, which are in the Bible, so they do need to be discussed. All kinds of weird, strange stories that are entertaining. They can be fun and entertaining to hear and to teach on. But now let's read what the Bible says about these strange doctrines. Hebrews 13, 9 says, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart may be established. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. So we should talk about the strange doctrines, but we shouldn't spend all of our time on those things. We should, shouldn't make a ministry out of those things. Remember when you were young and you wanted to watch the same show over and over and over? That is how these sci-fi babies operate. They find a strange doctrine in the Bible... And they turn everything into being about that one topic. A good example of a strange doctrine is the giants in Genesis 6. 
Now, I myself do believe the sons of God in Genesis 6 are angels that fornicate with human women, but it would be wrong to base your whole study or ministry off of the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of all which they chose. Some people know more about the fallen angels in Genesis 6 than they know about salvation. Or the gap. I lean towards there being a gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. I don't spend every study talking about the gap fact or theory. I have also found out these topics many times don't do anything but cause a bunch of fights and division. That doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about them, but when you make that your main line of study, you're going to end up causing nothing but fights and division. And I've noticed a lot of times when people just stay on a topic, they start believing it so hard and so much that they'll break fellowship and accuse others of not being saved if they don't agree with them. Which is another mark of a baby Christian, causing divisions over something really stupid. It is stupid to fight over these minor and strange doctrines. There are all kinds of supernatural stories and strange doctrines in the Bible to talk about. However, we shouldn't major on these things or make a ministry out of these things or cause divisions over these things. I'd suggest learning how to treat other Christians first. You can do this by reading the Pauline epistles, listen to what he says when he talks about your interactions with other people. Do this before jumping into the strange doctrine. And Christians know all about how to prove or disprove, as I was talking about earlier, a gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, but they can't even practice Ephesians 4-32, which says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. But moving on, another type of baby is the Diotrephes babies. I still have a hard time saying that name. The Diotrephes babies. Third John one nine says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. And there are those types of baby Christians who have to be the man. They have to be the center of attention. The one who everyone comes to with the Bible question. They have to be first and foremost in everything. They don't understand Colossians 1.18 in the slightest, which says that in all things he might have the preeminence. In their mind, they think they are worshiping Jesus Christ, but the Christian life has become trying to be the world's greatest. They are like the LeBron James chasing the ghost of Michael Jordan, except they are chasing Sammy Allen, Peter Ruckman, Jack Kyle's, or any other Christian who gets recognition. These babies are so eat up with pride and their ego is so huge that they have it written all over their face. They love long standing ovations and there's nothing more sickening than seeing a preacher get a standing ovation for five minutes. Why would you make a statue of a preacher? <clears throat> That's sick. Uh, these guys remind me of the Pharisees. Matthew 23, 7 says, And greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. They love the greetings in the markets, and they like to be called nice-sounding titles. Luke eleven forty three, Woe unto you Pharisees, for you love the uppermost seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets. Everything some Christians do is to be seen of men. Matthew 6, 5 says, And when thou prayest, Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Matthew 23, 5, But all their works they do for to be seen of men. If you think about it, why would we need to care about being seen? The only person that it matters who sees our life is God. The people who listen to these studies that I make have never even seen my face, most likely don't even know my name. But Christians can get caught up in making a name, like those people who built the Tower of Babel. And when you try to make a name for yourself, you end up doing it without God. 
back when they was making the Tower of Babel, it says this in Genesis 11, 4. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So they're trying to make a name. And you have a lot of Christians, baby Christians, trying to make a name. You have this so-called New Independent Baptist Movement who is trying to build their own great big Baptist kingdom and make a name for themselves. This is the mark of a Diotrephes baby. They want the preeminence so they have little minions all over every state to try and knock off every branch of Independent Baptist so that they can be the Big Daddy Independent Baptist group. They attack the Ruckman crowd, the camp meeting crowd, like Sammy Allen. They go at the C.T. Townsend type guys. They go after the internet crowd like Robert Breaker. They go after men like Bob Gray, who doesn't ever say anything bad about anybody. And you really can't name a preacher that they don't dig up dirt on. You can literally go to their website or YouTube channel and type in a random preacher and no doubt about it, they will have a video where they mock and make fun of that man or Christian or preacher, whoever it is. Pretty much anybody who may have a bigger name than they have, they attack him. And it's all about being seen of men, all about becoming the greatest, all about having the preeminence, all about attention, all about being a self-centered baby Christian that needs to grow up. But next, there is another group of babies that are angry babies. You have Christians who are angry at everybody. Many times they're angry because they're not getting the center of attention, as we just talked about. They're not getting the preeminence. And when babies don't get the preeminence, they get mad. They start yelling at you, ridiculing you. This is an angry baby. The angry baby can even fall under all the other babies mentioned because all those guys are mostly angry. They have no idea how to be nice to another Christian or non-Christian and you have some Christians who only want to talk about God hating people and they will wear t-shirts that say God hates fags or God hates whoremongers. Why not wear a shirt that says when we were yet without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Why not wear one that says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Don't get me wrong. Don't leave out sin. Let them know they are a sinner, but give the gospel. You can say, God hates a person all day, but the people at all these gay pride parades, they hate God back. You may just be making them hate him more. Romans 1 calls them haters of God. They already hate God. Let them know that even though they hate him, he loved them enough to bear their perverted, vile, ungodly sin on a cross and die for them so that they could get saved. It is a weird thing what some Christians will say in front of the whole world. I watched a documentary where the interviewer asked a preacher... What is your advice for a homosexual? And he said, just kill yourself. He wants them to die and go to hell. He doesn't want them to get saved. He doesn't even believe that they can get saved. I'm the type to spend more focus on the wrath of God than the love of God myself. But you can take it too far. God is angry with the wicked every day. But some Christians are even more angry with the wicked than God is, it seems. And then a lot of times their anger is imbalanced. They will be more mad about a man wearing shorts and a woman wearing pants than they are about a baby being aborted. Or they will be more mad about a preacher being divorced and remarried than they are about a preacher being a Bible-correcting, NIV-thumping, ultra-grace sissy. They'd walk a mile to hear Joel Osteen preach before they'd walk across the street to hear a divorced and remarried pastor who's a Bible believer. A guy said to me one time, I'll listen to any preacher as long as he hasn't been divorced. 
I kept my mouth shut, but I, in my head, I'm thinking, has this guy even, does this guy even care about the Bible? I heard another preacher get behind a pulpit and tell another preacher to go to hell. And this is right after he sung a song out of the hymn book. That is no way for a Bible-believing Christian to act. Paul wished himself accursed if the Christ-rejecting Jews would get saved. And even the Jews, they're called enemies of the gospel. The man the preacher told to go to hell has been preaching the gospel for over 40 years. Why would you tell him to go to hell? When you do things like that, that is the mark of an angry baby Christian to tell someone else to go to hell. What is up with all these people putting everyone in hell anyway? Someone said one time, since Ruckman lived so long, I bet John R. Rice was up in heaven thinking Ruckman didn't make it. And that's probably true. A lot of these guys get so jealous of each other, they start doubting each other's salvation. And when the other one dies, they say, well, he's in hell. I've obviously missed out on something. I can't see into hell. This isn't the millennium where the lake of fire is on earth and you can go forth and look on the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against God. I can't see in hell. I don't know where someone went when they died unless they just told me that they rejected Jesus Christ and that they're an atheist. I don't have a right to say who's in hell and who's not in hell. There are Bible correctors that die, liars that die, people that deceived a whole lot of people, but I don't have super spiritual eyes to judge someone else's salvation. And I don't wish hell on anyone. But next we have the ultra grace babies. First, I'd like to say I believe in the grace of God, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I show grace towards others more than a lot of people. I don't get bent out of shape over disagreements or make fun of anybody who disagrees with me, but you have these watered-down Christians who don't use the right Bible. They listen to contemporary music. They listen to Joseph Prince and Joel Osteen, and they are the opposite end of the extreme of the angry babies. Well, the angry babies will only focus on the hate and wrath of God, and they hate everybody. The ultra grace guys only focus on the love of God and eat everybody up. Only one exception. They have no grace towards a King James Bible believer who talks about sin and hell and the new versions being out of hell themselves. They have no grace towards that group of people like us. But everyone else is fine. They think rock music is okay. Eminem is okay. Boy George is okay. Ellen DeGeneres is okay. And I'm weary of a man who will take sides with those wicked people and the wicked world over a King James Bible-believing Christian who hates sin. What the problem is, they love the world. And James 4, 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. These ultra grace guys don't know the Bible because they don't read the Bible. When they do read it, it is mostly an NIV or an RSV or an NKJV, the Message Bible, the NLT or the ESV, and the new Bible versions are of the devil and contemporary Christian music was created by the devil to keep new converts in the world instead of setting their affections on things above. And my flesh still likes wicked music, and it likes some contemporary Christian music, even though a lot of it just sounds corny and it's not even catchy. But there is something in me that says that stuff is nasty. And a Christian is in a spiritual war. You got one part of you, your flesh that likes it. Something in you is telling you that is wicked. And the devil uses the music to keep your flesh having the victory. Why do you think these ultra grace preachers are now allowing secular songs in their churches? They started out with the contemporary. It sounds just like the world. And now they just, they say, hey, why not just let them play secular songs? We can do what we want. We have a license to sin. 
they get the truth down, they can't lose their salvation, which I believe myself. I believe once saved, always saved. But I don't use that as an excuse to just go and do whatever I want to do. Andy Stanley's church has people singing classic rock songs. I saw another church the other day playing Eminem songs. Second Corinthians six seventeen says, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate. Supposed to be separate from the sinful world. Uh, when my daughter has something she isn't supposed to have, and I try to take it away from her, she holds on to it and won't let go. That's because she is a baby. She acts like a baby. And many of these ultra grace babies are holding on to the world and they won't let go, even when God has them picked up off of their feet trying to get it out of their hand. First John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. But this has been the different classes of baby Christians. I'm sure there's more, but these are the ones that I could think of and that I've noticed the most here recently. But what can we do to not be babies anymore? Very simple. Just read the Bible. Apply them practical things that Paul talks about very frequently to your life. And this is going to help you. Stay praying. Praying and staying in fellowship with God will keep you from being a baby. And maybe you're not saved. I can tell you how to get saved. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, it says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the Gospel is this, Jesus Christ died, He died for you, he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He died by shedding his blood. The Bible says in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. You get forgiveness of sins by putting your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The finished work of Jesus Christ is he died by shedding his blood. He died for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Why do you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Because you're a sinner. You need your sins paid for. If you don't get your sins paid for, then the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, and not just a physical death, but a second death in the lake of fire. If you die today without putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will die physically and then one day die a second time when you're cast into the lake of fire. If you don't want to be in the lake of fire one day, then you need to come to Jesus Christ as the guilty sinner that you are and believe on Him. Come to Jesus the best way you know how and believe on Him. If you feel like you need to ask Him about it, say, Jesus Christ, I believe I'm a sinner. I know I'm going to hell, and I want to put my trust in you and be saved. Then go ahead. Saying something with your mouth isn't going to stop you from getting saved, contrary to what many of these people are saying. But come to Jesus Christ and do it before it's too late.